If you'll turn over to the book of Matthew, chapter 4. Matthew, chapter 4. And uh, if you'll go down there to verse uh, <clears throat> verse 12, and we'll be, uh, this is where we're going to be focusing on the message. And uh, there in Matthew verse 12, it says, Now when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the seacoast and the borders of Zabulon and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah, the prophet, saying, The land of Zabulon and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw great light. And to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And the title of the message this afternoon or this evening is Preaching and Teaching. And the reason that I, that I chose this, and you see right there in verse 17, it says, From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And just before I kind of give you the background as to why I chose this message, is, you know, what's interesting is if you look there in uh, Matthew 4, verse 1, immediately it says that Jesus was led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And then this is where he was tempted three times of the devil. Immediately after that, he finds out that John is cast into prison. And then he decides to uh, start the ministry. And it says, uh, and then we also see shortly after that, a couple verses after, is where he, uh, he goes and he gathers Peter and Andrew. And we're going to see later on, uh, you know, basically this is where he starts gathering the disciples all the way to, you know, we'll go to Matthew 9 where he does that. But one of the things that's constant is that not only is he preaching, but he's teaching. And the thing that I'm going to focus on is, you know, I think a lot of people, at least when I was growing up, I always considered that if somebody was to preach, they had to be a pastor. You know, it wasn't until you actually read the Word of God that a preacher is those that are given the task, those that are saved by grace, to give the task to give the gospel. And then the other thing that we're given the task, men, women, and children have certain roles, is to teach. You know, the older teach the younger, and then, you know, the younger have to be subject to the, the leadership. And then there's the special anointing for that pastor. Now, the pastor is not only instructed to teach, but he's also instructed to feed the flock and to pastor and to lead it. And that's a different position. But preaching is not uh, something that is, uh, should be foreign to any of us. Now, there's rules, right? And we're going to go through those. Not everybody is, is called to preach in the church. But as far as out in the world, giving the gospel and teaching and guiding disciples, we've all been instructed to do that. And I'm going to show you in the Bible. The reason that I, that I put this message together is, you know, I was talking to a friend of mine last night, and uh, he, uh, he's a former Seventh-day Adventist like me, and he's saved by grace through Jesus Christ. And he was uh, texting me, and he's like, send me some verses on the Sabbath. I'm talking to so-and-so, and we're going back and forth. So he's talking to another Seventh-day Adventist. Unfortunately, if you grow up in a, in a false religion, it takes a long time to basically dilute all the people that surround you. Uh, even if you're not friends with them, even if you have nothing to do with them, you're going to run into them in circles because that's who you grew up with. And uh, he was talking to a doctor that is a, a former, I mean, not a former, is a Seventh-day Adventist. And not only is he a Seventh-day Adventist, he's several generations Seventh-day Adventist. His dad's a preacher and he has several things that, that he's dealt with. And, and then when he called me, I said, so how did it go with this uh, doctor? And he's like, well, you know, it didn't go like I planned. And he started telling me the things that the rebuttals he was giving him. And I started overcoming him. I said, oh, you should have gone to this verse, or you should have told him this, or you should explain that. And he's like, man, I really just need to, he goes, I really need to be better prepared. And one of the things, one of the dangers that we, we make is that, you know, when, we're, when we uh, lead others to Christ, or uh, when we're out soul winning, we need to have that follow-up. You know, soul winning is good because it gets them into heaven. But if we want people to grow in, in Christ, and if we want to have more laborers, and if we want to go do more for Christ, we actually have to teach and we have to disciple and we have to get, have them learn the word of God, not only for the, the, the purpose of 
teaching so that others can go out there and lead souls to Christ, but also so they can improve their lives here on earth and so they can actually reach and attain for rewards in heaven. You know, there's much more to life than just leading someone to Christ. And I'm not downplaying that. I mean, we do that every week. I think it's real important. But there's something to be said about getting fed from the Word of God. And if you guys uh, uh, will turn over to Matthew, or just stay there in Matthew. Let me read for you real quick. Uh, stay there in Matthew 4. I'll read for you real quick uh, Isaiah 61.1. It says, The Spirit of the Lord, God, is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. And basically, you know, if we were to put this in perspective, this is a, a soul-winning message, right? What is it? He's binding up the brokenhearted. There's a lost world out there. It says to proclaim liberty to the captives. The only liberty is through Jesus Christ, right? And the opening of the prison to them that are bound. And the only way to get out of the prison of sin is to get into the Word of God, right? And of course, there's other... I mean, Isaiah 61 itself, you know, that's a whole sermon we could do on its own. But stay there and be, uh, go down to verse 12 of Matthew 4. And the first thing I want to point out is Jesus set the example of preaching and teaching. You know, Jesus is the one, the cornerstone. He's our foundation for everything we do. And of course, Jesus left us many things as an example. Uh, and we could, and you know, that's, a, that's another topic for another day. But specifically for what we're talking about today on preaching and teaching, Jesus actually set that example. If we go to Matthew 4, verse 12, he says, it says, the Bible says, now when, Jesus, uh, now when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the seacoast in the borders of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah, the prophet, saying, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw great light, and to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, and, and shadow of death, light is sprung. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, "Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand." And I know I just read that, but what's interesting, and, and I wish I could have done a whole sermon just on that. You know, Jesus quoted God's word and His word constantly. And if we were to go to Isaiah nine verse one, we find that that's the you know He is quoting directly from Isaiah nine verse one and two, and it says, "Nevertheless, the dimness." Uh, shall, shall not be such as was in her vexation, when at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward did more grievously afflict, afflict her by the way of sea beyond Jordan and Galilee of the nations. And then there's that verse that he just quoted, The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light, that they dwell in the land of the shadow of death. Upon them hath the light shined. Jesus is that light. This is in Isaiah 9. This is the prophecy of Jesus coming to the world. But if we look at the example, he's teaching them out of God's word. You know, even though he's leaving his word, which will later be inspired into the Gospels and will be written, he's also uh, teaching them and he's learned over time as a man on earth from God's word. You know, we see that that's real important because Jesus is the one that set the example. He's the one that's going out and he's getting the disciples. And it's real important that we teach and preach from the Word of God because one of the, one of the things that's real interesting is, you know, I love that. And I know Pastor I actually loves that uh, set of scriptures in John 6. And I'm not using that here today, but in John 6 where he preaches a hard saying. And after that, people leave him. So, you know, if we're preaching and teaching couple of things will be apparent. We're going to get good soldiers for Christ, but we're not going to get as many as we think because people will leave. And number two is the ones that stay, they're going to do great works for the Lord. You know, David had 30 mighty men, not 300. Jesus had 12 apostles and really, all, I mean, 12 when Paul came at the time that he walked on the earth, he had 11 because Judas was a, you know, of the devil. But it's really important that we look at things in perspective. And one of the things that's, that, that we need to focus on is when we're, uh, that we shouldn't be shy about preaching the Word of God. And what I mean by that is not just the soul winning, but also the discipling, standing on God's Word and studying. And then the other thing that we shouldn't shy away from is teaching. You know, because one of the things that, that, that uh, will stand out is, you know, I always learn this. If you want to learn something well, guess how you learn it? You have to teach it to somebody. 
You know, there's nothing like reading something and then applying it, right? That's theory and application. But then there's also something to be said for when you, uh, you read the theory, you apply it, but then now you have to teach somebody else to do it. You know, one of the biggest challenges in, in basically any business is training somebody. You know, you can do it. And I don't know if you've ever run into people and they say, oh, um, I don't know how to do it. I mean, I know how to do it naturally, but I just can't teach anybody. I, I don't know how I, how, how I get things done. Well, that's a person who hasn't learned or matured to the point where they, you know, that's a sign of maturity when you can turn around and teach somebody something else. You know, from the Word of God, if you can expound and you can break it down and teach people how to read the Bible, how to interpret, how to apply it to their lives, that's a really important trait because you're, what are we doing? We're going to improve life. You know, the world's going to hell in a handbasket. You know, if I just wanted to quote all the news this week, we, you know, there's just horrible things going on. I mean, we could just point to New York. We could point to California. We could even just point to politics in general. But if we were teaching and preaching the Word of God in its foundation in the churches of America today, we probably wouldn't be in the state we're in because then people would know that there is commandments and that there is fear of the Lord and that there is blessings and there's cursings on our life for the things that we apply to God's Word. But, you know, let's go in, let's go in order. So Jesus sets the example. And what's the first example? You know, when he recruits uh, the 12 apostles, he recruits men. And God gives the men a specific calling or a specific duty to not only be the head of the household, but also be uh, the leaders in the world and even be in the church, right? And if we look, look at there at verse 18, it says, And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And, and it, what's interesting, I didn't pick this because Pastor preached on it on, on Sunday, but it just happened that that's the same verse. So, you know, just, just know that's just the way the, God, the way the Word of God works, right? And he said unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. And going on from thence, he saw two other two brethren, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, in a ship with Zebedee their father, mending their nets. And he called them. And they immediately left the ship of their father and followed him. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. So the first thing Jesus does is he gathers men. He gathers leadership. And what does he do? He leads by example. He's teaching in the synagogues. Well, guess what the apostles are doing? They're learning. And then he's preaching the gospel in the kingdom. And so they're watching. And, you know, if you look later on, and we're going to see that in verse 9, you know, this is where he then prepares them to go out two by two into the world, preaching into the highways and the hedges, you know, into the, in a, in a, in a, the uttermost parts of the world. But, uh, you know, so we see example of soul winners in the Bible and people that are uh, not saved uh, and did not preach. In, I mean, that are saved, but they didn't preach and teach. So what do, you, what do I mean by that? Well, we see the example of soul winners. Jesus went and got the apostles. We see in the book of Acts, you know, the day of Pentecost, we see that they're always preaching and teaching in the synagogues and daily in the temple. They were preaching Jesus. But the one thing that uh, we don't see uh, specifically, but we do know that the numbers exist because many multitudes follow Jesus. They're just not pointed out by name. Is that there's many who are led to the Lord, right? But they, but the follow-up, you know, the churches that were planted, they, that they do all the work, were they teaching all those individuals about the Word of God? Were they discipling them? Now, we know the church grew, but there's always been that, that dichotomy, right? Those that are saved and really take the Word of God to heart, and they want to grow, and they want to walk in the Word, and do great works for the Lord. And then those who get saved, and they just they don't even show up to church, right? And so if for us that come to church and for us that want to continue to grow, we need to learn how to teach and preach the Word of God, right? Safe people commend us all the time, you know, when we're out soul winning, but they never join us. We, you know, we, we get that every, uh, at least once a month, we'll knock on a door and they're like, oh yeah, we're saved by grace and they give you all the right answers and they're like, oh, that's great. 
you know, that's a blessing that you're out there doing the work of the Lord and it's a great job that you're doing. Just keep up the good work. And what I'm always tempted to say is just that we're not there to pick a fight is I'm always tempted to say, well, get your shoes on and let's go. You're not doing anything. You know, let's come with us. Because, you know, the laborers are few. I mean, we really could use much more soul winners. We could use hundreds and thousands of soul winners every week and we'd still have the work, our work cut out for us. You know, it's not enough that they're saved. And what I mean by that is it's enough for heaven. But, but there is, you know, if God just wanted that, if he just wanted to give us the salvation message and us be saved by grace and, and now we're going to heaven and that's it, then, you know, we'd have a few pages in the Bible. But God gave us a lot of instruction. I mean, we have the book of uh, Leviticus. We have the book of Exodus. We have wisdom in Proverbs. We have Ecclesiastes. You know, you go to the, you know, you have instructions in Second and First Timothy on, you know, the church and congregation and being a preacher. And then you go, you know, you have prophecy. I mean, there's a lot. So obviously, if God gave us his entire word, there's something to be said about going out there. Not, if you're not teaching, well, then sit somewhere and learn so that you can turn around and teach. And the other thing is, if he gave us so much word, meaning if he wants us to preach, then there's more to preach than just Jesus' salvation message. That's the core. That's the foundation. But there's more to be said for that. Let's go to Matthew 9, just turn a few pages over and go to verse 35. And we'll be there, verse 35, Matthew 9. Verse 35, it says, And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. So he continues doing what he's been doing. And when, the, and when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them. See, the reason we teach and preach also is because then God teaches us how we should feel about the lost. You know, what, are you moved with compassion on them because they were fainted and they were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he unto the disciples, The harvest is truly plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of harvest that he will send forth laborers into the harvest. You know, what's, what's interesting is, you know, if you just, and we're going to look at that, go to, you know, just continue there in verse 1 of Matthew 10. What happens next? He said that when he had called Unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Now the names of the twelve apostles are these, the first Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew his brother, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, Philip and, Bartho and Bartholo uh, Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the publican, James the son of Alphaeus, and Labias, whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who's, who also betrayed him. These twelve sent forth and commanded them, saying, go not, go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any of the city of the Samaritans, enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as ye go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So he, he has compassion, and then he prays for the laborers, but being that he's Jesus, he gets the laborers right away, right? The 12 apostles. And then what does he do? He sends them out because he's moved with compassion. And too many times, because we don't get into the word and we don't teach a proper uh, view of the Bible, you know, then we get uh, uh, a mix of Christianity that might have one of the things right, but they have other things wrong. And one of the things that I think is wrong is that there's not enough compassion in Christian circles or Bible believing, saved by grace through Jesus Christ people for the lost. You know, we live in a nation that would rather bomb first than save first. You know, we live in a nation that, that uh, has uh, trained um, officers of the law to shoot first instead of ask first. And I'm not, you know, the police and how they do things, we have to respect the laws. That's, but what I'm saying is, if we, if we look at that as our guide, then that's how we start to act. And that's what I mean by that. If we turn on the TV and all we see is war and law and order and destruction and how we should tell others to be, then what we start doing is that's how we start to act. But when we look at the Bible and we see preaching and teaching because there's people out there that are hurting and God, if Jesus Christ had compassion for the lost, how much more compassion should we not have? You know, because he set that example. You know, Jesus is the king of all. But the big thing that he left us is, he says, look, I've gathered men. 
to go do the work that I've said about, you know, he did the father's business and we need to be about our father's business. Not our biological fathers, but God the Father, right? It says, uh, go to 1 Corinthians 14. Go to 1 Corinthians 14. Just turn over a few pages. 1 Corinthians 14. We're going to be there in verse 33. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 33. Verse 33. It says, For God is not the author of confusion. Why do we teach so we're not confused? There's a lot of Christians today that are confused about many things. And what it does is it muddies the water of salvation, right? It says, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. A couple of things we see there is all churches of the saints. And number two, we see churches, plural, right? Not one, uh, not one denominational church. This is, that's a, a real important point. It says, let your women keep silence in the church, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. So men, not only are we supposed to be out there doing the work of the Lord, but we're supposed to be raising our families correctly. And it starts with our wives, because our wives, who, what are our wives going to do? They're going to raise our children, right? And then that way our, our children, whether they're boys or girls, will have a right uh, view of their role in life. You know, my little girl, my prayer is for her to, I mean, obviously be safe, but to grow up to be a godly woman that will serve a husband one day. And my, my prayer for my, daughter, my son is that he will, you know, be, obviously be safe, but also raise up, you know, maybe, you know, my daughter calls me Dodo because she couldn't say daddy. So she calls me Dodo, which I, you know, biblically, it's not a, a bad name. I know they have the Dodo bird, but, you know, I always say, then what I, want, what, what I would like is, if I don't have that opportunity, then I could be the father of Enrique, my son, you know, one of the mighty men of the Lord, just like Dodo was one of the, 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 he was the father of one of the mighty men of David, right? And, you know, there's a war, a spiritual war, and I want to train him up to fight those spiritual battles. You know, that'd be great, but that's our responsibility as men. And, you know, I'm not, each one of these is, and I know I say this a lot, but it's because it's just so, Interesting how it is. Each one of these is a sermon on its own. There's so much more to men and, and the, the roles of leadership and how they should be, grow and how they should go into things. But the, the way that you do that is you preach and you teach. Right? I mean, one of the things that I admire the most about, you know, this church and Pastor Cobb is, you know, Pastor Cobb would be in my circles what you call old school. And what I mean by old school is not only is he older, but he's also old school in the sense that you know, he's tougher. He doesn't get rattled as easy. You know, we have a bunch of individuals my age and younger who, I mean, you can't even breathe on them incorrectly without them getting offended. You know, I mean, you, you, tell, them, you tell them something that they don't agree with and they go home crying to mommy and daddy, you know, expecting uh, some kind of reward for, you know, their feelings. You know, they're referred to in our society, actually, as snowflakes. I like to call them girly men, like Arnold Schwarzenegger did a couple years back when he was trying to run for whatever. He called them girly men, right? But, you know, there's something to be said. Jesus never acted effeminate, never acted girly. And let me, let's just clear that up. I was talking to somebody on Sunday, and he didn't have long hair. You know, Jesus was a man's man, right? And what do you want to teach your, your, your young men and, and boys? To be men. And, you know, a sign of a good man is not if he can fight well or, you know, if he has a big beard. As a matter of fact, I can't grow a beard. But it is if he can preach the word and stand on God's word when things come tough. You know, if you look at both examples, you know, Jesus was tempted. He was under trial and tribulation. He, was, he had just fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. And immediately, and then he found out that John was in prison. And what did he do? He didn't sit around and mope and get depressed and cry and ask for a pill to help him with emotions. No, he went out and what? He went to preach and he went to teach. You know, what's a way to overcome depression? Go out there and teach and preach. What's a way to, you know, not look down upon yourself? Raise your children and your, and your family right. You know, work with, uh, you know, talk to your wife. Teach her the Word of God. I mean, you know, in order to teach your wife the Word of God, you've got to learn God's Word, right? And right in your heart. And uh, let's focus on women now. Go to Romans 16. Just a few pages back. Go to Romans 16. 
You know, the Bible, the reason I chose that verse in, 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 uh, in 1 Corinthians 14 is because it says that the women should be silent in church. You know, today, women with their feminist movement, have a, they take an issue to that. Oh, so, you know, there's no issue. They're not any, they're not less. The Bible says that the gospel is equal to all of us, but they just have a different role, right? Women have a different role that God's given them, but one of the things that he hasn't, he didn't say, it's not an excuse, is, see, Everybody always wants the spotlight, men and women. You know, that's the natural nature of things. But God didn't stop them from preaching the Word of God. As a matter of fact, you know, if, if we have a group of, of men and women soul winning, great, it's better. You know, sometimes women can reach certain people better than men can. There's nothing more disarming than a woman with kids preaching the gospel on the door. It's probably way better than if two guys show up and knock on your door. You probably think it's an undercover cop or something. You know, but go to Romans 16, verse 1. It says, I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is the servant of the church, which is at, and that's a centuria, that ye receive her in the Lord as becometh saints, and that ye assist her in whatsoever business she hath need of, for she hath been a succor of many and of myself also. Greet Priscilla and Achilla, my helpers in Jesus Christ. Go down to verse 12. It says, Salute Tryphena and Tryphosa who labor in the Lord. Salute my beloved Persis, which has labored much in the Lord. And then I'm going to go through a bunch of these. Just and This is men and women, but it says, Salute Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother and mine. Salute Asyncritus, Phlegon, Hermes, Petrobus, Hermes, and the brethren which are with them. Salute Philologus and Julia, Nereus, and his, and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints which, which are with them, salute one another with a holy get, kiss. The churches of Christ salute you. So we see there, Paul, he didn't, you know, he's the one that, that wrote Romans and first, you know, first and Second Corinthians, where he's talking about the separation and the roles, and women shouldn't speak in the church. But it, here, he's praising them. He says, look, salute them all. These are my fellow laborers. They've worked with me. They're out, they're out there soul winning. They're out there preaching. They're out there teaching. And so there's something to be said about women in, you know, in their ministry, not in the ministry as in, like in the traditional sense where, you know, they're, women aren't, there's no such thing as women preachers, you know, leading a church or women pastors. I mean, what I mean by that is women pastors that preach, but there is women that are preachers outside of the church that go soul winning, or they can teach their children, or they can teach others' children. You know, if, if the women get together and have uh, multiple children in a room, they can teach them. Go to Philippians 4. Go over to Philippians 4. We're, we're there in verse 1. Go to Philippians 4, verse 1. It says, Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and long for, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. I beseech you, ye odious, and beseech Syntyche that ye be of the same mind in the Lord. I, and I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. You know, Paul's given a list, and before he gives the list, he salutes men and women, and he says, look, they, they've labored with me. And then let me tell you something. Look, all these things, the things that are true, that are honest, that are just, that are pure, that are lovely, Whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. And then he reminds them, look, how, why should you do this? Because I, you've learned and received and heard them and seen in me. Well, how do you do that? Well, I mean, you've got to show up to church more than once a week. You've got to open your Bible more than once a week. 
You should probably pray a little bit more than what we're praying now. These are the things that are important for us to go out there and grow in God's grace. I mean, you can't figure out what's true if you're not reading God's word because it says that word is true. You can't figure out what's honest unless you know what the Bible says should be honest, right? And what things are just and what, you know, God's word is pure, the Bible tells us. You know, he is pure. How do we get purity in our lives? Through God's word. But we have to teach and, and, and preach that. And, he, and, and Paul here, he says, look, you've learned this from me. You've seen this, this happen. So uh, with women, it's real important because just like men, we have this role to lead. And we have this role to have protection for our families. And we have the role to be the leaders of the church. You know, Christ is the head. Well, women also have their roles. The first role is given in, in 1 Timothy 5.14. And while, I, while I, I read that to you, turn to Titus 2. You know, it says, I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give not occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. For some are already turned aside to say, after Satan. So women, young women, you know, you shouldn't, they shouldn't be in college or career-minded. And, you know, I know this is the type of message that will rub a lot of people the wrong way, but the reality is, I mean, either we're looking for whatsoever things are true and honest and pure, and we agree with Philippians 4, because people love those verses, but if we love those verses, then we're going to agree with 1 Timothy 5.14. It says, I will therefore that the younger woman marry. It's good for a woman to marry, so she's not out fornicating. It's also good for a man to marry, so they're not out fornicating. Bear children... Be fruitful and multiply and replenish your. That's the first commandment God gave us. And guide the house. And you know, guide the house isn't just cleaning and washing dishes. You know what's more important than that? Raising your children up right. Educating them. You know, the first experiences that my daughter or son will have with the gospel, besides when I'm home and I'm reading it to them, is through my wife. You know, she spends the majority of the time with my children. So she's the one that's entrusted. I'm entrusting her, and I have given her that responsibility that she needs to lay down the spiritual foundation so that when I come in and reinforce it and lead them, they have something to build upon. You know, it's my, my duty to lead them, but I can't do that if my, my other half isn't doing their part. And she can't get that reinforcement if she does her part and I don't do my part. It has to, it's a, you know, that's why God created marriage. Right? It's a, there's a, there's a purpose for that, and there's much more to that. But, you know, go to Titus 2, verse 1. It says, but, but speak thou the things which have become sound doctrine. And this is kind of the secondary role. And there's other roles, but these are just two that stood out for this message. It says, that the aged man be sober, sober grave, temperate, south in, sound in faith, in charity and patience. And I know we're not talking about the men, but I just threw that in there just to make sure we, we added another, another layer to to the, the men preaching and teaching, but it says, the aged women, in verse 3, likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good obedient to their husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. See, it's important that we have a, you know, a balance of preachers and teachers. There's responsibilities that come with that. And you know what happens? You know, one of the things that I've always been against, and, and, and I will always be against, is the, world, the world's example of female friendships. Now, my wife, I mean, she, she can have all the friendships. I'm not going to, but my wife has a really good... Uh, foundation when it comes to you know you're looking for friendships that are going to edify but what I'm talking about is you know I grew up in in the Hispanic culture being a Mexican I mean it's, it's only natural right I mean if I was born in Mexico my parents are Mexican we're going to be around a bunch of Mexicans but one of the things that's really uh, detrimental to marriages in the Hispanic culture is that women get together to complain about the husbands and then what they end up doing is then they they end up comparing and then the woman that listens to all this goes home and then she basically throws up all this negativity on the husband and it becomes a, a point of contention. You know, the Bible says, be ye, you know, that she's the husband of one wife. I mean, that I'm the husband of one wife and that she's the wife of one husband. So meaning, my wife and I, we work our things out with us. 
the challenge is that most people want to go out. It didn't say here, hey, get together to talk about your husband and how he doesn't help around the house and, and how he doesn't buy you flowers. You know, one, one man's romance is another man's like, he would never do that. And that's like the worst thing, right, for women to get together and be like, oh, well, my husband sends me flowers once a week, you know. And so then the wife comes, the other wife comes home and she's like, you never send me flowers once a week. Maybe there's something wrong with our marriage. But here, what did it say? That they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet. That means if you're discreet, you're not going to be gossiping and comparing and murmuring. Chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. It's interesting that, you know, the idea of women getting together should be to fellowship and edify each other. Just like men should be to encourage each other to fight. You know, uh, I, he doesn't like to be called out by name, so, but there's a brother in here that was talking to Pastor Cobb and saying, hey, Pastor, you should, uh, you know, just spring up on, on, uh, on, on Enrique and have him preach a message when he's not prepared. And, you know, we jest about it, but there's a reality to that. You know, as men, we should encourage each other to face tough situations. And I mean, I'm not saying that just springing a message off the cuff is, is a tough situation. What I'm saying is men are not here to hold each other's hand, you know, and sing kumbaya and make each other feel better. They're here to push each other to be ready for battle. You know, they're here. And I'm not talking like we're going to go out and have a fist fight. I'm talking about the spiritual battle. As a matter of fact, there's nothing that annoys me more than when I get around another man and, and they're just kind of like too feely and too touchy and too emotional. I don't know. There's something about that. Maybe it's just, you know, now that I read my word, but even before that, you know, my dad just didn't raise us like that. You know, my dad, he's been a loving dad. He said, I love you. He's given us hugs. But it was never like all the time. And, and, you know, it was never like real mushy and girly and just uncomfortable. It's real, you know, if Pastor came to me and like gave me a hug and said, I'm so proud of you and, you know, patted me on the back, I'd probably never be in this church again. You know, I mean, I just want to, you know, hey, good job, pat on the back and let's go to work again, you know. And I mean, I'm not, if, he gave, if we gave each other a hug in mourning or something serious, that's different. But I'm talking about, you know, today, preachers are getting up there and you got all these churches and men are dressing like women and then they're getting emotional and there's nothing wrong. You know, I've, I've seen preachers cry on the pulpit for serious stuff, but I'm talking about the preacher that cries like every sermon. He's crying for everything. You know, the wind blew the wrong way, he's crying. You know, he read this, book, this uh, verse, verse 8 of Philippians 4, and he's crying, and, and, and he's emotional, and, and the things, and that's because we don't have a proper role of preaching and teaching. You know, they, all it is is Jesus and salvation, and Jesus and salvation, and Jesus and salvation, and they forgot that there's a whole other 66 books of the Bible. You know, and let's, let's just close out with uh, the children, and you know, how we should focus on the children, because children start to understand at a very early age. And it's very important that we get the roles right because if the men aren't doing their job and the women aren't doing their job, then we're not going to teach the children. And you know what? Children can teach other children. It's called peer pressure. You know, it's called social uh, interaction. You know, that's one of the reasons why we're going to shelter our children and we're going to raise them in the home and we're going to homeschool them so that they have the tools, the appropriate tools to face the world. And I'm not talking about like sheltering like some people where they don't want their kids to, to witness anything negative. You know, I, I've heard parents are like, oh, we never fight in front of our kids. You know what? My wife and I, we're not, we're not perfect. Every once in a while, we have an argument. You know what? It's good for our kids to see us argue and make up so they understand that, hey, sometimes life is tough, but you can overcome. It's okay. You know, I'm not, uh, but people, you know, and then the, the kids come out of the home over shelter and then they see the reality and they're like whoa we've been missing out on all this or it's the opposite right they're not sheltered enough and they're like oh we, we just want to partake in it all but if you give them the right tools of preaching and teaching then when they go in the world they're like oh i know how to read that's a red flag my dad taught me about that that you know god's word says that i shouldn't even look upon you know the wine when it's red and my oh my dad taught me that i should avoid that kind of woman so that i don't fornicate you know, and my dad taught me that, no, it's not okay for me to pursue a career. It's okay for me to look for a godly hus husband because he's going to take care of me. 
right? Are we, I mean, because where does our faith come from? From the Word of God. So let's go there. Go to 2 Chronicles. And, and you know, I, I picked out 2 Chronicles because I really love uh, the story. We're not going to go through it all. We're almost, we're, we're almost done there. Go to 2 Chronicles 34. And I just love Josiah because Josiah was eight years old. I mean, I just think about when I was eight years old, my dad bought us a Nintendo. And I was more worried about, you know, uh, beating Mario Bros than I was reading God's Word. Now, obviously, I didn't get saved till later in life, so I'm not making like this comparison like, oh, woe is me. But the reality is when I was eight, I was nowhere near this, this level of maturity. You know, there's something to be said about raising your children in God's Word and godly. You know, Josiah says, go to there, verse 1. We'll just read a couple of verses. This, Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned in Jerusalem one and thirty years. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, and walked in the ways of David his father, and declined neither to the right hand nor to the left. An 80-year-old boy is given the responsibility of a kingdom, and he does right in the eyes of the Lord. I mean, think about the parents, the preaching and teaching that must have gone on in that home for this 8-year-old to take on that responsibility. It says, For in the eighth year of his reign, so now he's 16, while he was yet young, he began to seek after the God of David, his father. So not only is he obedient, he still hasn't come to the, a complete understanding of what he, why he does the right things, but now he's really seeking for it. It says, and in the 12th year, he began to purge Judah. So what is that? 16. Now he's 20 years old. This is a 20-year-old young man, and now he's going, he's going after it. It says, Perch Judah and Jerusalem for the high places and the groves and the carved images and the molten images. And they break down the altars of Balaam in his presence and the images that were on high above them. And he, uh, he cut down and the groves and the carved images and the molten images. He break in pieces and made the dust of them and strode it upon the graves of them that had sanctified unto them. Go down to verse 19. And it says, And it came to pass when the king had heard the words of the law that he rent his clothes and the king commanded Helkiah and Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, and Abdom, the son of Micah, and Shaphan, the scribe, and Isaiah, a servant of the king, saying, Go, inquire of the Lord for me, and for them that are left in Israel and in Judah, concerning the words of the book that is found. So all of this training he had gotten was just passed down. You know, his parents were godly, so they taught him to be godly and seek after God. But now they find the book, the, the word of God, right? And he, what, did it, what happened? He, he says, Concerning the words of the book that is found, for great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out upon us, because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord to do all that is written in this book. So now he reads the book and he realizes, hey, even though I'm seeking after uh, God like David and I'm doing, I'm trying to be godly, I realize, hey, we're, we're missing some stuff. There's some stuff in this book that we just haven't covered. You know why? Because they weren't in the word of God. They weren't preaching and teaching at that time. He's bringing it back. Go to verse 27. God, I don't want to spend too much time. It says, But be, because thine heart was tender, so, you know, he does all this, he learns everything, and then right there in 27, he says, Because thine heart was tender. How do you get a tender heart? Read the Word of God. You know, too many people today are calloused and quick to make judgment and go after other fellow believers. Just because you don't agree on one point, or, you know, they're not Fox News Baptists, as I like to call them, or, you know, you didn't pick the right president, or you didn't take the right political stance. But what it says, because thy heart was tenderhearted, and thou didst humble thyself before God, when thou heardest his words against this place, and against the inhabitants thereof, and humblest thyself before me, and didst rent thy clothes, and weep before me, I have even heard thee also, saith the Lord. And, you know, the rest of the story is that there was grace for a period. You know, Manasseh was such a bad uh, young king that there was going to be destruction on the people. But there was this uh, the period of grace because Josiah was a man after God. And then shortly after that, his son, uh, Jehoiakim, uh, messed up. And then, I mean, you know, I mean, obviously we could, you go into it and then we see the, 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 the impending doom. But you know what? I, we're in impending doom. This country, I mean, we've got issues up the gazoo. I mean, there's just all kinds of things. But you know what we can do? We can stave it off if we get into God's Word and we preach and teach. Go to 2 Timothy, and then we'll be in 1 Timothy, and we'll close out. We just got a couple of verses. 2 Timothy 1, or just go to 1 Timothy, and I'll just read 2 Timothy for you. Go to 1 Timothy 3. Go to 1 Timothy 3, but 2 Timothy says, uh, 
When I call to remembrance the unfaith faith that is in thee, which dwell first in thy grandmother Louis and thy mother Eunice, I am persuaded that in thee also. This is talking to Timothy. Paul's talking to Timothy. He says, look, you learn this from your mother and your grandmother. The role of women, right? They raised up those children. They guided the house. Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by putting on of my hands. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. Be, now that, be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his purpose and grace which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. But it is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher, of the Gentiles. So even Paul, before he lays, it says he's going to lay hands on, on Timothy, he's like, look, do this because I was appointed and now I'm appointing you. And the reason I did that is because you were led and raised right. And then there's something to be said, and I'll close out just First Timothy because, uh, you know, that was in the message, but there is something to be said about the preacher who stands behind the pulpit. And the Bible gives us instructions in 1 Timothy 3, 1, he says, This is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. So our desire for those that love to preach and be pastors is it's a good work, but then there's rules and there's things that, qualifications that we must meet. It says, A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. See, I'm not doing anybody justice and pastor's not doing anybody justice if he's not preaching and teaching. See, it's not his duty to just get up here and, and have swelling words and sound really good and give you all the good stuff you want to hear. It's also his responsibility and my responsibility to learn the word so I can teach you the things that you need to learn from God's word. See, but the only way I, I can do that is that I have to learn them myself. It says, not given a wine, no, no striker, not greedy, a filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. That, you know, this is a long checklist. Not one that, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? So I have to, you know, it's our duty to care and take care for the church of God. Not a novice, lest being filled up with pride he fall into condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach in the snare of the devil. So there's something to be said about preaching and teaching. See, you, you, it, it's, it's a preacher that chooses, a, uh, or a pastor that chooses another pastor. You know, Paul appointed Timothy. Pastor Cobb appointed me. Right? Why? Because they're the ones that are looking out. So it's very important, pastor's duty, and I pray that, you know, I meet up to those standards, because it, it was a serious thing when he took me under his wing and decided that maybe he was going to anoint me or appoint me or ordain me as a pastor. Because that's not, it's not something to be taken lightly. And then for me, that responsibility now is, hey, look, you wanted this and it's a good thing, but now you've got this responsibility. You know, and, it, and it's something to be said, but overall, the end of, you know, just what I'd like to leave today is, you know, this message wasn't about to, uh, uh, being a pastor. But I wanted to close out because that way it covers everything. This message is about being preachers and teachers of the Word of God. And I've given you clear instruction for both men, women, and children. You know, I got saved as an adult. So I just, you know, pa I did the, the math. That pastor's been preaching for 54 years. So he started when he was like 28. You know, I didn't get ordained till I was... 36 or 37 it was 36 I was 36 years old when I got ordained so I, I if I'm if I preach for 54 years it'll be I'll be like in my 90s you know God willing maybe I can do that but what there's something to be said I can't change my past I can't change what I've done that didn't do I was not I was eight years old and I wasn't after like Josiah you know living a godly life I was just being a kid but there is something that I can do I can preach and I can teach so that maybe my son, if that's what he, 
you know, if that's what his desire is to be a preacher one day, then if it isn't, that's okay. But whatever his desire is, that he can do the work of the Lord. Because you know what? The apostles and the prophets and all those guys were, did the work of the Lord. But there was a bunch of people. What did, what, uh, did God tell Elijah? There's 7,000 that haven't bowed to me. See, the responsibility isn't just on the preacher, I mean, on the pastor. And the responsibility is on the congregation. It's on the whole body. So we need to just focus on that. So let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for today. And thank you for the opportunity to preach this message. And Lord, just to help us to do uh, your duty for, for our lives and for the lives of others. You know, we've all been given responsibilities. And your word says that you've allowed us to do certain things. And one of them is to preach the gospel. But not only preach the gospel, Lord, but also to teach your word and disciple others. Because, to be honest with you, as churches grow, there's no way that the pastor can just sit with everybody and meet them once a week and disciple all of them. I mean, even in a, in a church of 50 members, that, that'd be so time-consuming. But if you have leadership in that church that can fellowship with others, they can teach them. They can go out and soul win, and they can teach them the Word of God and expound you know, on your principles and on your statutes. So, Lord, just give us that, uh, that uh, sobriety. Give us that maturity. Give us that discipline and that focus to teach and preach the Word of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.